Hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the workshop and to another classic bike video. Um, we're back on with the Bantam. Uh, we're going to have a look at the motorcycle itself in this video, um, making preparations for the engine to go back in the frame. Uh, we're not far away from that now. So we're going to have a look at the petrol tank. Um, it's currently full of rust, so we need to do something about that. And then we're going to have a bit of a conversation about uh, the way forward with this project and uh, how I see it progressing. So um, I hope you enjoy the video. As ever, thanks very much indeed for watching. Thanks for your subscriptions. And uh, don't forget to click the like button if you like what, what we're doing. Um, so with that said, let's get on and have a look at this fuel tank. So we're looking at the, um, at the Bantam, at the bike itself. Um, we haven't paid an awful lot of attention to um, the motorcycle itself we've mostly been concerned with the engine or I would should say really exclusively concerned with the engine in these videos that I've been making so um, we're actually going to turn our attention to the cycle parts um, a little bit more now and uh, the job that I'm doing now you can see that I've got a drain hose attached to the tank going to that um, that oil drain uh, container and I've been draining out the old fuel and you know, you know what modern fuel is like. It was absolutely stinking. I don't know how long it had been in there, but um, yeah, it was uh, horse's urine, shall we say? And uh, obviously, it's premixed, so it's left an oily residue. Now, the tank has got quite a bit of rust inside, um, surface rust. And when I was looking at the carburetor and I had the little plastic fuel filter in my hand, um, there was definitely rust flakes in there. So, you know, we've got to stop that from happening if we want to get any kind of reliability out of this bike. So I'm going to have to do the same job with this tank that I did with the um, the little Gorelli um, bike that I did a few weeks ago. I may not have to put the sealer in, but I'm definitely going to have to get the rust out. So I've drained out the fuel and uh, let me just get you a little bit closer up so that you can have a look. OK, so we're peering down the filler neck and um, you can see that there is some some rust in there. Let me just see if I can don't know if it's better with the light or without the light. We'll, we'll try both. Um, as you can see, yeah, some sort of brown oxidation in there that we've got to get rid of. And um, I've just swilled it out with white spirit after I drained the petrol. Um, th this is kind of the way I do it. Um, it seems to work. I swill it out with white spirit, give it a really good clean out to get the oil residue out. And then um, I chase that up with methylated spirits. Um, you know, the um, just your ordinary purple um, meths that you can get from your hardware uh, shop. So I, I give it about half a bottle of meths and I give it a really good swill out. And then I drain it down again. And um, I just sort of leave it for a while and let it evaporate off. And then I'll, I'll, I'll come and tip the tank up and shake it around a bit to try and get the dregs out. And you generally get a little bit out of the, uh, out of the drain pipe. Um, as you do that um, until it's completely dry and then I'll, I'll leave it let it dry and then I'm going to use a, a citric acid um, based corrosion remover um, which is uh, water you know water soluble you, you dissolve the stuff in there uh, in hot water and then dump it in the tank and leave it and uh, it generally does quite a good job actually I've done uh, I've done a couple of tanks this way before so that's the plan that's what we're going to do with the petrol tank um, there's the filler, which is not in, in terrible condition. A little bit of rust on there, but that'll come off. Um, there should be a little uh, measuring jug here as well, I believe. A little measuring cup for the two-stroke oil, but that's long since vanished. And I imagine they're probably quite hard to find. But um, you can see the general condition of the tank. It's not too bad. Um, a little bit of uh, corrosion creeping under the paint there on the little thread like corrosion we would call that filiform corrosion uh, in my industry uh, when you get thread like corrosion creep creeping under the paint but um, as I say it's pretty solid there's no rust under the tank um, so yeah I don't think we've got any problems with um, perforation so once we get the corrosion out of there we should be all right so that's going to be a task uh, that I'm going to be doing over the next few days well, once again, we're staring down the filler neck on the VSA Bantam fuel tank. 
and uh, I've moved it on a few steps uh, following the um, white spirit uh, rinse I then used the uh, cheeky methylated spirits chaser and uh, then I rinsed it out with hot water I then took the tank outside and um, I dried it out with the hot air gun on a low setting now if this is starting to sound like a hairdressing uh, tutorial trust me it isn't um, if you've seen how much hair I've got left you wouldn't take hairdressing tips from me but um, anyway yeah best to do it outside because if there's any fumes left in there which you know even just rinsing it with the the hot water doesn't get rid of them all um, you don't really want those in the workshop so now I've mixed up the citric acid solution uh, you want about 250 grams in five liters of water there or thereabouts you can make it a little bit stronger but um, it's not advisable to go too strong because of how it works um, it's a process called chelation and what's happening in there is the um, the iron molecules in the rust in the iron oxide are actually being broken away the bond is being broken and they're being drawn into suspension um, now the little sort of movements that you can see and the, the odd bubble here and there is hydrogen because hydrogen is produced during this particular reaction um, so you, you don't want to put the lid on and you want to keep it in a reasonably well ventilated area um, just like you would if you were charging up a battery um, you can see that it's starting to go a little bit yellow I hope you can see that um, that's probably the best view you're going to get um, so we're going to leave it overnight and then we'll uh, we'll come back tomorrow and have a look clean it out and uh, see how we've got on um, the reason why you don't want to leave it for too long is because it will etch the metal um, you know it's it's going after those um, it's going after those iron molecules and um, you know obviously steel contains iron molecules but at this concentration um, it's, it's you know it's not going to do any harm to the metal uh, but if you start making it super strong or leaving it in there for extended periods of time then there's every possibility that you can um, you can etch pits into uh, into the steel but um, you know I've done this a lot of times I've never had any problems and uh, you do get a pretty clean tank um, so we'll leave it at that we'll come back um, when it's had a chance to, to do its do its magic and we'll see what result we get well there we have it um, I've drained off the um, citric acid and uh, it's had a good rinse out with some very hot water and then it's had the uh, methylated spirits through again just to chase out the water and then it's had a little bit more of the heat gun and uh, I'm just going to shine my little um, bendy torch in there um, I wish I could get the camera in at a better angle but um, you're probably seeing the back wall there of the tank this sort of grey colour um, and that's very typical of the finish that you get with the citric acid but it's perfectly clean and um, you could put petrol in that tank now but you can see marks maybe there where the rust has been where it's removed it and uh, it's all gone so it works um, certainly works for me anyway uh, let me think um, are there any pitfalls not really um, it's, it isn't messy, there's no harsh chemicals, um, there's nothing that's really going to hurt you. Obviously you've got to be careful when you're using hot water to swill it out because the tank will get um, just as hot as the water you're putting in there. So, you know, obviously be sensible and wear gloves. But uh, apart from that, um, there isn't really any, uh, any pitfalls. Um, when you've got the heat gun in there, just do it in a ventilated place because you don't want the fumes. Um, mix your... Uh, granules carefully make sure they've all dissolved the, the the mix should be clear like water if it's cloudy you haven't dissolved them properly and um, they'll probably sit at the bottom of your tank and do nothing um, but um, as I say um, it works for me you be the judge whether or not it will work for you this isn't a, this isn't a sort of tutorial how to this is just a how I do it um, trying to think uh, if it goes wrong if it doesn't work what have you done wrong um, probably the um, the biggest problem is the cleanliness 
uh, you need to get all the oil and, and petrol and, and stuff out of it first. If there's, um, like with any chemical reaction, really, if there are contaminants, um, it alters the chemistry and, um, you know, you won't get the same results. And um, that's really it. Mix your stuff well, make sure everything's clean and uh, it should work for you as it works for me. But uh, again, anything that you do is, uh, is entirely at your own risk. Um, this is how I do it. There are other methods out there on the market. Um, there are probably companies that will do this for you um, if you're at all doubtful as to um, you know doing a little bit of chemistry that you need to do in order to uh, make this happen then uh, steer clear of it but uh, it's worked for me over quite a few uh, tanks it isn't particularly expensive I think I pay about 12 or 14 pounds for a kilogram of citric acid and um, you know that's enough to do sort of four tanks or if you know if, if you don't get it all out of the first go and you need to do it again you'll you'll get two tanks out of it so or, or maybe three but as i say there we go um, i'm going to do the resin now because um, i've got some and um it would be silly really not to do it when i've got some um, i'm pretty sure that the tank is sound but you just don't know how long that rust has been in there and um, it only takes a little pinprick of a hole to, to start leaking petrol. So um, that's going to be my next step. I'm not going to show that on camera because you can always go back and look at the, um, the little Gorelli fuel tank that I sealed with the resin if you want to know how to do it. So um, that's going to be the next step and then the tank will be um, good for fuel. So here's a view of the Bantam, uh, hopefully a reasonably good one, and uh, I've got you up on the milling machine table, so be careful, don't fall off. Um, we're just having a look over the bike really, and I'm going to waffle on a bit, so hopefully you'll bear with me. Uh, this is the bike pretty much uh, as bought. I haven't cleaned it or done anything to it, apart from take the engine out. Um, and I, as I said earlier, we've pretty much exclusively been dealing with the engine in these videos. Uh, you've seen me do the uh, fuel tank. We've got the rust out of that. Um, so that's really all I've done with the uh, motorcycle side of things. Um, when I bought this bike, my uh, sort of plan was I'm going to get an old Bantam or a Tiger Cub and I'm going to build a Green Lane Special or a Trials bike. And the rationale behind that was I have pretty much retired from road riding. Um, I wasn't enjoying my motorcycling anymore. Um, every time I went out on my bike, and I had a, a Yamaha TRX 850, which I loved that bike, but every time I went out on it, I thought, you know, someone's gonna knock me off. Um, the attitudes of other road users was just getting, um, well, getting a bit depressing, quite frankly. I wasn't enjoying it, so I, I got rid of the bike, and I thought, well, I'm gonna get, uh, get back into my restoration and, uh, and get something to work on. So that's what I did. And um, this came along and you know, it's not in bad condition. So I'm in two minds. Do I continue with the Green Lane Trials type project or do I just keep it as it is as a road bike? You know, considering what I just said about road riding, how often will I ride it? How much enjoyment will I get when I do? It's, you know, it's a little bit of a balancing act. It's a nice looking bike, but will I really use it? Um, but I think initially, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to I'm going to get everything working, get it running, and uh, and just sort of see how I like it, and then um, possibly it will develop uh, or morph into um, you know something that I can use on the green lanes and on the ridgeway and and uh, places like that. So that's the plan. Uh, to that end, um, if we look at the seat here, uh, I think if you were to sit on that, you'd be in danger of disappearing but um, D7 seats don't come up very often um, I don't want to put a brand new one on so something's gonna to have to be done but if we're gonna keep it as a road bike we need to do something about that um, if I do eventually decide to morph it into a trials bike I've got this um, which is a, a modified rear subframe someone's had a bit of a go at making a trials loop they've had a go at making a single seat it's not it's not the best but it's a starting point. We could probably do something with that. 
You've also got a set of heavier weight forks. Now, I think these are off of B175. And a lot of the pre-65 guys use these. And I think they use the C15 ones as well. But, you know, that would make a nice front end for, pardon me, uh, a Green Lane Special. The original forks being a bit a bit too spindly, really, to um, to handle that kind of work. So, you know, we've got these sitting. We're not in a rush. Um, we can make a decision and decide what to do. So, there we go. Um, Electrics-wise, there are none at all on the bike. Um, there's one bit of wire, and that's coming from the back light, and that is it. But we've got our bone CDI, so we can start from scratch. That's going to make things a lot easier. Um, I don't know if you can see. Let me just move the camera ever so slightly. Just move over there. It's a twin switch, this bike. Um, uh, it has an ignition and a lighting switch. And um, some of the Bantams only have one switch. And um, the engine, when it came fitted to this bike, was an earlier engine. I think I've mentioned that before. And it had the single switch electrics fitted to it. But as I say, we've completely negated that now with the Bone CDI. So, um, you know, whether we decide to put it in road trim or trials, forward slash, green lane trim, um, we'll have to do something with the electrics and we'll have to start from scratch. But uh, that's that's um, fairly easy. So there we go. Um, do leave me a comment if you've sort of you know got any opinions in either direction. Um, let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. See you soon.